Hey ho, let's go, space people, Lorenzo here, episode 27 of Tylo and Elu, and this one will follow a little bit faster than the previous one, which is evident by this video being there, I don't know why I have to say these things. Anyway, today we have a build queue, I designed rockets and queued them to build, have a look at that. We have the base lander for Elu, we have the base lander for the moon, and we have the heavy lander also destined for Elu. Now, some explanation is in order, I added a mod. We are going to build a launch base on the moon. That's right, we're going to build an extra planetary launch pad for, for which we'll gather resources and then we can build our interplanetary conquering fleet from the moon, which will save on launch weight, basically. Should be a lot easier to launch things from there than from Kerbin. That's the plan anyway. Also, it will give us a playground close to home to experiment with the base building. As discussed in a previous episode, the base lander for Elu will be a well a, a preliminary shot at this first window here, a low delta V and slow launch for Elu. Look at that, the build time is about the same as the time to the launch window, that matches up perfectly. And then we'll shoot the heavy lander, we'll shoot that for the high delta V and less slow Elu window. It's in 50 days if we build that after the base lander destined for the moon, that will all work out. Meanwhile, we have science that is progressing slowly, and we have course corrections that have to happen, well, um, lots of days into the future. So we'll not worry about that for now. For now, let's uh, do some time warping. Heavy lander has changed sphere of influence. That's fine. Do we need to check on that? Let's check on that. Heavy lander. Heavy lander, heavy lander, where is it? Scrape trajectory out of the sun, that's still on course for... Jewel, let's actually, that's not that great a course. Let's, let's plan a course correction trajectory move there. So that we can um, fine tune its approach to, 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 to Jewel. Uh, here we have the target set. We'll do a corrective burn at the descending node where we can probably make our thing in. Um, where we can adjust our encounter to the plane of Jewel so we don't enter the system all crooked. And we don't need a maneuver node for that. We can make a alarm add on descending node. Call it course correction yeah done that at the alarm 29 days that's a um that's fine that's after this that's after this this um this planned launch so no interference there Back to the time warping, launch pad reconditioning. Jesus, that's taking a while. We've already built like three quarters of the next ship before the launch pad has been reconditioned. That could turn into a bigger problem with bigger ships. That's one of the reasons why we also need a extra launch pad and we need it on the moon. Of course, we can't just have a launch pad. We'll need a industry, a VAB, a resource gathering and smelting stuff thing. So we'll be launching lots of stuff up there. Also, you may have noticed that the three ships I put in the build queue have depleted our money, so the next thing we're probably going to do is earn some cash again with some contracts. But first things first, and we're going to shoot something to Elu. Let's work on that. Let's roll that out. That's four days. Holy smokes. These vessels are getting slightly more massive because they need to go so far and actually carry weight. So these rollout times are increasing proportionally. Fortunately, I think a few days won't hurt on this launch window. That's the, that's the good thing about launch windows that are that far apart. We can just kind of approximate them. Anyway, I hope that's accurate because we don't really have a choice rather than do it this way. Alright, is that rolled out now? It is. Let's go to the pad. Oh, very important. Let's not bring any Kerbals. Remember, Kerbals are expensive. And we are launching this one on autopilot. Because it's very much an experiment. If this manages to land somewhere useful on Elu, fine. 
look, there's the extra planetary launch pad thing. We don't have any extra planetary launch pad, so we'll close that up. And we'll time warp here up to daytime, whenever that happens. We're three and a half days late. We're three and a half days late, but let's see. Here we are, ready to go. Throttling up and going. Well, this is your first look at this marvelous ship. It's got boosters, it's got liquid boosters, it's got engines, it's got stages, solar panels, and some top mounted thrusters. These will serve to well, lower the base unit down, really. Now, there's one fairly important design consideration. We cannot jettison the outer liquid boosters below 10 kilometers. If we do that, and this is the result of one test, if we do that, the air resistance will slam them into the ship. Okay, let's get rid of the solid boosters. They are safely now being dropped on the space center. Hopefully they've got some cleanup crews to deal with that. 25 guys with nets trying to catch these spent boosters. That's my, my mental image for now. Let's throttle back a little bit so we don't waste all our fuel in pushing against atmosphere. And remember we need to gain that 10 kilometers of altitude if we want to decouple safely. And we want that. We really, really want that. Alright, full burn on the last drops of fuel. Alright, that should be good enough. Let's cut the fuel just to be sure. The thrust and separate. This seems to be going well. Well, some explosions. That was uh, fairly risky. We got push pushed off course a little bit because of that. But the rocket appears to be veering back to the proper course. Yeah. That was a little bit hairy, but hey, we don't have separate drones in lock in the science tree, so there's really not much choice rather than do it this way. And we are now gaining altitude properly. We are at 16 kilometers, and the remaining engines should push us into orbit without further incident. That's what I'm hoping anyway. By the way, I did notice that on the last episode the sound was pretty horrible, clipped and stuff, and that was probably because I set the microphone gain levels a little bit too high. I set them lower now, but it, this microphone is definitely showing its age, and I am I have been intending for a few months to get a better one, I just haven't got around to it. Er, so yeah, that may happen in the near future or not, it de really depends, and at least I'm aware of the problem, eh? Let's, uh, let's put that as a, uh, as a bright point, a uh, point on the horizon. Let's let's work towards better, better quality of life, audio, uh, food, and everything. Anyway, gaining altitude, descending into orbit. I'm going to cut the video because then we can probably do a few things in this episode, or at least more than just this launch. So I'll show you when we're in orbit and everything is happy. See you there. All right, we are happily in orbit. A course for ELU is planned. It will be like the most hideous small window because remember ELU is very small so its sphere of influence is also fairly small. At least it's far away so that makes it larger again. Um, I don't know. Anyway this encounter was uh, hard to get. Right. You will note the node will happen in three minutes. It estimates our burn time at 2.3 but that's based on this engine which is almost run out so it's hard to estimate these things accurately. Anyway I hope this is a good spot to do this burn from. Powering up the engine to steer and as soon as we hit the blue reticule we will fire it up full thrust. Boom there we go. Aiming at the planet which is always a little bit hazardous. Well, only aiming a little bit at the planet, but we are at 200 kilometers up, so it should be fine. Now, this fuel is going to run out any moment. But our first base building block is underway. I think this tank will supply 2 kilometers per second, no sweat. And we have we have the top bit of fuel, um, if I can get that into view. We are, we are on the dark side of the planet. Uh, we have this tank here to maneuver us around Ilu and do the landing. Hopefully that will suffice. Of course it is far away and we don't really know the figures, so it is a bit of a guess. But if this all works, we'll have our first thing on Ilu in about four years. And remember, the voodoo scanner will only arrive there in five years and a hundred days, so this one will overtake it. 
this may even we we did state the goal at one point to overtake this scanner. I, I meant with like fusion drives and future tech, but just with smart orbital mechanics, we made that happen anyway. And remember, this is the slow path. In a few days, we're gonna send the heavy lander, which is gonna take the quick path. And well, it's I I don't remember, but it will be quicker than this uh, four year thing. Anyway, this burn will take a while more. I will cut, it, cut out the video again and show you when the trajectory is all looking good. See you then. And alright, here we are with just 180 meters per second to go for our insertion burn. But as you will see, the fuel has just about run out on this engine, which uh, does present a problem. Of course, we have the top engines here, which should serve as our landing thrusters. Um, of course, the fear is that they might not last for to actually be landing thrusters at this rate. We have only used them for a little, a tiny little bit, so it might it might still be all right. But this is a precious little fuel to well to do a, a course correction with because we're not quite there yet. We are almost there, but just not quite. We should probably plan a, um, a alarm clock for this thing. Let's see if we can do that. Uh, can we... closest target distance? No. No, no, the ascending node is all the way over there. Yeah, we can do a descending node alarm. This will happen in... No, we need to wait before we're actually leaving Kerbin's Sphere of Influence, which is, which is fine. Anyway, the point I wanted to make is that as long as we get this into orbit around Elu, that's still sort of good. Because this has docking ports, well they're very invisible now, but the um, stay putniks are attached to them. This has docking ports. Actually, it's only the one stay putnik. Hmm. Design flaw there, I thought there were two. Anyway, we have docking ports, so once we develop super duper interplanetary craft, we can just go and fuel this up and, and then go then go land on Elu. Uh, not ideal, but well, we will use our science data once this is in orbit to determine if this can land with the fuel it has. Maybe it will. Maybe it will be able to. Anyway, for now, let's go back to the space center and hit our fast forwarding button a few more times because there is a few things that need doing. We need the course correction for the heavy lander in eight days. That's the first thing up. And then, of course, we're gonna need to launch the base lander, which will be finished before the pad is actually reconditioned. So let's... Alright, this has now changed sphere of influence. Base lander moon is about finished. So I suppose we'll be doing two course corrections. We will be trying to fix the... No, we'll be trying... We will, we will be doing the heavy lander course correction. Jump to ship. And we will be putting a... Kerbal Alarm Clock Marker for the Elu base thing. Right, let's have a look here. We should still be headed for Jewel, and we are. Let's see what our projected... Yeah, see that's nowhere near the equatorial plane that we want it to be. So let's plop down a maneuver node here. Focus on Jewel again. This is a nice trick, by the way. You can do this if you want to fine-tune your arrival orbit. And we're gonna tweak it. Actually, no, apparently we're not gonna tweak it. Here we go. I need this to be equatorial. And ideally, I also need this to be somewhat closer to the planet. So, there we are. This is looking better already. And now just to check that this will actually be the right orientation, I'm going to do a little bit of time warping. To see... Yeah, come on Kerbal Alarm Clock, don't mess up my plans. To see the ways in which these moons are orbiting, yes, they are going in the same direction. So this is a valid course correction. Yeah. This will this will give us some some nice some nice windows for intercepting Tylo. Can we get closer to to Jewel? Yes, we can. 
All right, this is worthwhile. 400 meters per second, holy moly. That is a lot. That's causing me to wonder, did I do something really strange? But no, then, then again, this is arriving in a year and 300 days, and this is arriving in a year and 200 days. We're also accelerating by 200 days. Um, that's also fine, actually. So we will burn our engine. We will burn it slowly to turn the ship around. Cool, we'll do an acceleration burn to shave 200 days off this journey. Sounds good. We're whipping around the sun now at 11.4 kilometers per second. We shall perform this burn here. The node won't happen in two more hours. Let's actually be precisionist precision-esque, be precise and try and do the node, do the burn on the spot of the node. And we will probably be leaving some interstellar, interplanetary debris. This is close enough for my taste. Okay, fire it up. Burn, burn, burn. A couple more hundred meters per second. Oh, I forgot this is the efficient engine. Maybe we will not be leaving any interplanetary debris just yet. Acceleration burn, shaving days off the trip, so that the robot doesn't have to linger in space so long. Look at that, we're between planets, and this is our tiny lander, and this is all we have left in fuel. Well, this is empty. We still have lots of fuel in Delta V left, is what I'm saying. We are a Delta V heavy lander probe. Actually, I wonder if it will be enough. This is just three tanks. Delta V, that will give us huge, though, because, because the, the payload is so small. But I wonder. I wonder. Alright, this looks really good, but the game isn't sure that it will actually happen. That's a bit strange. If this encounter won't work, then... Oh, look at that, we extended our orbit. We did a, we did a proper acceleration burn there. But I am now incredibly worried that we'll not encounter Jewel. But this is so close, how can it not encounter Jewel? Are we somehow drifting a bit? So if we enable time warp, then, then it says we're just going to completely miss it. But if I don't do the time warp, then we're not going to miss it. Alright, that's really scary. Let's set an alarm for a sphere of influence change. Let's see if I can hit this button. One, two, three, now. Um, yeah, there we have it. We will, we will see whether we can make it then and there. And if not, we'll have to do a course correction. Okay, now we're going to leave this voodoo ship behind. And move on to other matters that are important in this episode. Let's see what we have. The, the lunar base lander is almost complete. Yes, we, we did this. We did this. la di da di da um, this is not relevant Relevant here. Uh, time warping, that's of course relevant. Let's have a look. This means that the ship is ready. Now it's just waiting on the launch pad reconditioning. Let's actually wait for that. I wonder if you can roll out while the launch pad reconditions. That would be cool. Alright, the thing we have here is a simplified version of the thing that was sent to Ilu. It has one fewer engine and has a bit, a bit less fuel, which should aid in the should aid in the, the delta V lift of um, um blah 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 blabbing. It has less fuel, so it will have less delta V, but it has less fuel and the same amount of engines, so it will lift off more efficiently and easier. That's the thought, anyways. We will see if that is actually true. That will translate into practice. We will launch it without crew again. We will send the crew separately, same as to Elu. Not quite for the same reasons, but for the reasons that Kerbals are expensive and we need to treat them with safety margins and stuff. This does not have any safety margins or Kerbals. Right, let's time warp to dawn. And in the interest of not letting this episode run a feature length, movie length, we will uh, launch it. And as soon as we're like through the staging bit, I will stop the video lots and lots until we're at the moon and 
probably at a nice landing site. Anyway, without further ado, let's launch this thing. As I said, it is lighter than the ELO thing. Look, it's um, it's got one less stage. And this was actually never tested. So I don't quite know. I don't quite know if these savings are real, if this will work. We shall see. It is going rather fast. I'm throttling back already, even though the solids haven't burned out yet. They have now. Let's ditch them. Back on the gas. We are tilting a little bit more. The rocket is squatter, so it should control better. But then again, maybe it's also more susceptible to aerodynamic forces. This is just wild guessing. I actually have no idea what I'm doing. Cool. We're at about 200 meters per second now. This is properly unmanned. We've got no stowaways. That's always a good check to do once crossing the 5 kilometer mark. That's about the last time you can actually see their little hands waving from behind the windows. Anyway. Yeah, we're a lot faster than we were with the other thing. This probably means that we need to be a little bit higher to safely ditch the boosters due to the increased air force. This is of course eating into my Delta V, but better safe than sorry. Let's ditch them now. Alright, go away, don't explode. Yeah, there we go. Same as before, knocking over the ship slightly, but nothing catastrophic. And now we should probably be thundering towards the sky. This is where the weight savings of the extra stage should be most noticeable, where we have the thrust of the three semi-big engines and, well, none of the weight of the second stage. Although with all these stages that drop bits on the way, I don't know what properly classifies as a first, second stage. This is the one with the big engines anyway. Right on, angling over 22 kilometers, everything should be fine, I'm not expecting any problems, which means I will um, delete the video from here on out, and I will rejoin with you once we are in a safe and happy orbit. See you there. Sheesh, time to rest my jaw. And look at that, not even properly in orbit yet, but by accident we launched straight into the proper window, and we can just keep on thrusting to the moon, isn't that wonderful? Here, periapsis is only 20 kilometers, but we don't care because this apoapsis is going straight to the moon. Hell yeah. Now, I really want this lunar base at the equator because we'll be sending lots and lots of launches to it, and that's just the easiest spot to get things done. As far as I know, there is no resource concentration. We just need surface material, so that shouldn't matter. If it does, well, we'll end up sorely disappointed, but we will be starting to... Well, we will then have to deal with that as it happens. There are engines on these base parts, there are docking ports, so we can refuel them if the need arises. So, yeah, probably not though. Alright, oh, wait, wait, stop, stop overshooting hard. But, let's actually make sure that we have a periapsis. I'm not sure what's happening to this. We have a periapsis, now this is probably good. Anyway, what I was going to say is that I seem to recall that at some point in the past... What is it with these encounters? I'm just gonna figure it out now. This The game tells me I have an encounter. It also tells me I don't. We're, we're gonna time warp to there and see what happens. I'm gonna throw a quick save just to be sure. Anyway, what I was going to say, what I was saying is that at some point in the previous couple of episodes, I think, I think I said something along the lines of, I don't want to colonize the moon because it's too boring and easy. Uh, and I still kind of stick by that, never never mind the fact that there is a colonization ship on its way there. Look at that, that's a surprise for if influence change. Um, well, we'll deal with that later. Anyway, we are happily entering orbit around the moon, so that's all fine and dandy. What I was going on about is that Things have changed now that extra planetary launch pads have become a thing that are possible because it makes sense to establish a manufacturing and mining facility on the moon in order to facilitate easier launches. Uh, that makes lots of sense, that makes all kinds of sense. We can have hazardous material storage, we can have nuclear power plants that can just blow up and not endanger anyone on the planet. 
all kinds of good sense and it's really close to home so we can practice with our base building kit and to be honest I got a little bit scared of all the parts and the ways they interact um, so it will be good to figure out how they all fit together. And of course the moon is a really easy spot to practice now having said that that's of course in completely jinxing we will probably now crash in the most rookie mistakey way possible but we'll figure that out when we actually get there so let's see we should be in lunar orbit now let's transfer to the map view and let's attempt to land in this boring equatorial region this is actually a dilemma for real life science missions like do you want to land in a nice flat area I mean from an engineering perspective the uh, answer to that question is an unequivocal yes we don't want to land on a mountain slope hell no we're gonna do it nice and easy and land in a desert somewhere fair enough makes sense but, surprise, surprise, the science you can do in a desert is fairly limited. I mean, compared to Earth, if you were to land in some lush valley, as compared to the Sahara Desert, where would you learn more about the planet? Versus what would be easier to land? And this, actually, what I'm trying to say is that the Curiosity Mars mission people, actually, uh, we are coming into crash, so I should probably do something about that. Anyway, the Curiosity Mars rover people, it's been a few years ago, but they solved this wonderfully. They made a sky, the Sky Crane, which should be famous by now. If you don't know the Sky Crane maneuver, Google that right now and watch the, not the NASA promotional videos. It's pretty amazing, it will blow your mind, but it's also a few years old, so I'm not going to elaborate too much. Anyway, what they did, they narrowed the... Uh, landing ellipse, the the, uh, the range that they were sure they could land in from a few hundred miles, basically desert sized, to a few dozen miles, basically, basically city sized. And this made them be able to land in a crater rather than in a desert, which has led to that mission being able to do all kinds of interesting geology. Um, because where you have a slope you have different layers and you can probe into the ground a little bit more you'll find lots more interesting stuff than uh, just in the desert by the way this landing spot is horrible it's riddled with craters small craters I want it to be in a big crater um, oh well we'll make do because our rocket has exhausted itself we are now transferring to landing thrusters let's try them yeah they work Let's extend the landing legs and stop babbling about curiosity. The landing legs don't work. Let's deploy them like this. Now this base module also has a function that's, that's called drop anchor and engage dampener. Sounds really fancy. I think it anchors itself to the ground somehow, which we will of course attempt to use as soon as we're landed. Alright, let's work out these side thrusters. They seem to work. We don't have SAS. So we will have to do this the old-fashioned manual way. There is our spent stage, which will serve as a sort of height indicator. Although we are also going to move away from it laterally, so it's probably not the best height indicator. Alright, we should be dropping pretty much vertically now. We will not be... We're not higher than 8 kilometers at least, and this is a fairly cratered landscape. Don't see any ridges. Oh, that's actually uh, a dimple there. We're landing about 85 kilometers away from a previous landing. Well, let's keep our eye on that bit. It seems as though we're going to land successfully in between all these craters. Well, there, I, I have detected a small problem. It's literally completely impossible to steer this without the engines on, which is of course logical because it doesn't have any any reaction wheels, it doesn't have any any uh, SAS capability, it doesn't have any reaction control system, it just has its engines. Right, we're coming down fairly rapidly now, let's slow down a little bit more, oh, we're, we're already going fairly slow, but these engines need to be on because otherwise we'll just tumble. Fortunately fuel doesn't seem to be the problem. We are in surface mode, that's good. We are at 10 meters per second, 9 meters per second. We're still fairly high up, I believe. And I have trouble determining which is a slope and which isn't. Are we coming down over flat terrain or is this one big slope? I suppose we'll find out. Where is the sun? 
like straight overhead so I should be looking for my shadow over there I'm having all the trouble in the world determining whether I'm actually close to the surface or not a bit close not that close we're slightly accelerating that's a nice that's a nice thing about these fairly underpowered engines is that you can use use the whole throttle range rather than just nothing at all I mean they've been silently putering away without actually making a, a big dent in the fuel supply I think we're close to the ground now this has got to be the most sedate landing I ever did let's try and kill that rotation that can't be good for landing Yeah, we're really close now this base is officially gonna be on a slope I think not great not great but we'll see how well we can manage a landing here down to five meters per second three three should already be manageable two and a half three and a half four isn't this wonderful a YouTube video about calling numbers three two one and a bit two and a bit okay drop anchor whoa that works really well of course this thing is tremendously top heavy because there's fuel in here and we are on a, a a big strong incline engage dampener what does that do build list uh, no I don't want to build list here I want the electricity reading doesn't seem to do a lot. Disengage the damper, raise the anchor. Ooh, the anchor is weird. It also stops it from settling. Perhaps I should have made this detachable so that it could fly off. But, whoa, we have lots of things here. We have, re we have the Pioneer model, it doesn't have crew obviously. It does science, it does data, it does research, it does greenhouse it does start the greenhouse lights on cool this does lots of things floodlights on it lights off I want floodlights come on floodlights no nothing's happening okay so we can move this we can move this do we maybe want to move it to the bottom over there right into that crater or are we happy with being a a slope a slope people a inclined base are we happy with that actually I'm not happy with that this is a horrible spot for a base do I want to be in one of these craters space will be limited slopes will be more present let's see or if I go like here and go out of it a little bit then go a little bit higher yeah I'm gonna try and go a little bit higher up the incline alright let's we don't have the anchor now okay we're going let's see where we're actually going we're actually going this way a bit climbing out of this because this is a larger crater that also has smaller craters in it I want to land over there somewhere oh yeah and of course I have no control unless the engines are on yeah I think this between those two craters would be a slightly better spot so of course I shouldn't forget that I need to cancel out this velocity again and I can't turn unless the engines are on. I mean, this is not really a spaceship, a space-worthy configuration. But, 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 I am happier with this arrangement. I, I do want to stop rotating. I want to stop my engine. So that I can float a little bit further that way. This, I think, is a nicer bit for a base. A little bit of time warp like yeah let's not go over those jaggies but all right slowing down good thing we brought the extra fuel another bonus is we'll be a lot less top heavy now so landing should be easier geez we even have 300 fuel units all right 
time warp inside that crater. Anyway, I'm not going to be too picky now. I'm just going to land here, not be any more cocky with the fuel I don't have. I mean, this ridge, it, it looks small. It should be fine. It should be fine. This thing doesn't handle as well as I'd hoped. I should maybe start adding reaction control thrusters on my, my landers at least. And dockers, things that dock need uh, reaction control as well. Oh, I used to be such a good space craft builder. Oh dear, full thrust is really lots of thrust. Okay. Oh yeah, this thing needed sedate landings. Got it. Just got a text from the project manager. The heavy lander will be complete in three hours. They're just topping off the fuel tanks now. That's great to know because in eight days it needs to be on the pad. Okay, enough dicking around. Let's kill our speed more. And yes, this this bit of moon is a lot more horizontal and a lot less inclined and just all in all friendlier looking than that horrible incline we were on before. Yes, we almost made it. Three meters per second. Well, here we're gonna do this number shouting game again. Seven now, five, four, three, three and a half. There is a shadow tilting over a little bit. It's not good. Tilting over a little bit the other way. Doing th three meters per second. Let's decrease that a little bit more. Two, naught. Ooh, dear, we're coming down ever so gently now. Don't want to stir up the soup because this thing does have soup supplies for the inevitable Kerbal occupation. Let's see... Here we are! Whoa, that was a little bit of a rough landing, but all in all, pretty good. Let's drop anchor. And let's deploy our antennae, which are more for cosmetic purposes than anything else. There are solar panels, of course, as well, to keep the batteries topped off. And this thing is now waiting for... Well, for more modules, really. But mostly for Kerbal habitation. I think the next thing should be a nuclear power plant, because, of course, the lunar nights can take pretty long. And it will... well, the, the base will take on a little bit of a weird look, because I think most of them will have this rockety superstructure. Anyway, yes, we landed the first piece of base. Let's return to the space center and prepare for the next episode. And by prepare for the next episode, I mean just think about the big launch towards Elo with the small lander, which will probably get there first of all three things that are heading that way. Anyway, we'll find that out next episode, when we will also probably return to the contract building to, well, gather some money because we're starting to go broke again. As always, thanks for watching. See you next time. I'm Lorenzo. Goodbye.